Now, with that said, let me let me wrap up the thousand year reign of Christ because I don't think I I articulated clearly enough so I don't confuse you. I will do a session, Lord willing, if you embrace this view. There is the view that says the thousand year reign of Christ is an actual reign of Jesus that begins on earth when he descends physically to the earth. Now, this is the view I hold to. It's called historic pre-millennialism. Historic pre-millennialism. Okay, that's the view I hold to, where Jesus returns physically to the earth, and he will establish his earthly reign on the earth for a thousand years. Now, let me explain this. I need your attention because we're going to end it with this. Let me explain this. This view teaches that when Jesus returns, and you got to read Revelation 20. Let me give you the chapters to read. Let me give you the chapters to read. You ready? Okay. Read Revelation chapter 20. Please read that. Ch Revelation chapter 20, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Okay. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Write these down, guys. We're not going to read them. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Write those down. And then John 5, 28 to 29. John 5, 28 to 29. Acts 24, 15. Write these down. Also include Revelation 2, 26 to 28. Revelation 2, 26 to 28. Okay. If you write those down, here's a summary of all these passages. Oh, and by the way, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. Specifically 50 to 58. Write these down. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 58. Specifically 50 to 58. Okay, now with that said, let me sum up. If we take the thousand-year reign of Christ as an actual little reign on earth, not a symbolic reign that began when he went, went to heaven, the Bible therefore teaches Jesus comes down physically and he brings the spirits of all those who have died in union with him. Then he will resurrect their bodies, reconstruct their bodies, reconstitute their bodies, and unite them with bodies now made immortal, deathless, and morally incorruptible. Morally, they cannot sin anymore. They can't die anymore. And he does that only for the believers at first. Only for the believers at first. Believers who are alive on earth, pay attention. Believers who are alive on earth, we will be transformed in a twinkling of an eye. We don't die. But our bodies, our natures are transformed by Jesus' almighty power where now our bodies are made deathless and sin is destroyed and eradicated. So like the resurrected believers, we now have bodies that are glorious, immortal, deathless, and cannot sin. Only us. All the other unbelievers who are alive, who don't go out to make war against Christ, the armies of the Antichrist, they'll be killed. They'll be destroyed. The armies, pay attention, the armies will be destroyed. The false prophet, right, and the beast will be thrown into the lake of fire. And by the way, I should have gave you this chapter. Revelation 19, read 11 to 21. Add that as well to the equation. Revelation 19, 11 to 21. Revelation 19, 11 to 21. I forgot to add that. Anyway. It says the beast and the false prophet will be thrown alive into the lake of fire. So, by the way, the first individuals thrown in the lake of fire won't be Satan. It will be the beast and the false prophet. They'll be thrown alive into the lake of fire when Jesus comes down. And the armies of the beast and the false prophet will be killed by the brightness of Jesus' appearance and by the sword of his mouth, and then the birds of heaven, the fall of the air, will feast on their dead bodies. Whether symbolic, literal, it's there. Revelation 19, 11 and 21. Then Satan will be bound, pay attention, 
Satan will be bound in the abyss, not in the lake of fire for a thousand years. That thousand years coincides with Jesus and believers who are now made glorious reigning on earth over the world for a thousand years. But during that thousand year reign, they will be ruling over those unbelievers who didn't go out to wage war. We're not part of the armies, but we're unbelievers who didn't believe in Jesus. They will remain in their bodies of sin and death. They will continue to sin and be punished for their sin and die, and they will continue to procreate. So the Bible is saying believers who are glorified with Jesus will rule over a world filled with unbelievers in sinful bodies that sin and procreate and die for a thousand years. You with me there? Or did I confuse you? Because I got to finish it up. This fulfills Revelation 2, 26, 28. Okay, now, that means during that period, unbelievers who are not glorified because they didn't believe will die and be buried, but they will have children and we will reign over them for a thousand years. Then after the thousand years, whoever am among the unbelievers are alive will then have Satan loosed upon them to then deceive them to declare war against Christ and the saints in the holy city. That's when fire comes and consumes them all. Satan is then thrown into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the beast are. Then the general resurrection of everyone and the judgment. Then all unbelievers are thrown in the lake of fire. That's when the earth will be changed into a new heaven, new earth. No more sin, no more pain, no more disease, no more death, no more Satan. Then God the Father comes down to join the Son and believers to rule on the earth in an earth made indestructible, immortal, no more sin, pain, wickedness, forever and ever. That's Revelation 21 and 22. Everyone with me there? You got it now? I'll do a session on this. Okay. So the end of Revelation is the story, is the story of God the Father coming down to meet the Son on earth. That's Revelation 21. Don't take my word for it. Revelation 21, 22. Joining the Son on earth where the Father, although he's not a man, he will appear visibly on a throne with his Son, reigning on earth with new Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem coming down over a glorified humanity. Human beings, men and women, made glorious, indestructible, deathless, morally incorruptible, in an earth where there will be no more sin, no more evil, no more wickedness, no more death, no more misery. That's Revelation 21 and 22. Yes, Tim. Yes, this physical earth will be made transformed. Okay. Now, the question is, because Zena keeps asking me, why will they reign over unbelievers? To give mankind a taste of what it's like to have the perfect God-man and perfect human rulers ruling over you. No more corrupt, immoral judges, politicians, lawyers, corrupting justice, perverting justice, oppressing the righteous, and helping the wicked to prosper. Because during those thousand years, unbelievers will see what it's like when you have the perfect God-man and perfect humans who cannot be bribed or tempted ruling perfectly. They're going to hate it. That's why. Jesus is giving them a taste. You've experienced various governments, kingdoms, and rules, and all have failed. Now experience what it's like when the God-man shows up with a group of glorified human beings who cannot be tempted to corrupt justice, who are mor morally incorruptible, ruling over you perfectly and passing judgment swiftly because they can't be deceived and misled by false witnesses to pass on wrong verdicts. Zina, you got you understand now why? You understand now why? That's Jesus is now saying. Mankind, you've experienced every form of rule, government, corrupt politicians, corrupt judges, 
lawyers, systems that have failed you miserably. Now experience what it's like to be governed by morally incorruptible, perfect humans and the God man. That's why they rebel. Do you know why they rebel? Sinners in sinful bodies cannot endure such a rule because when you have such beings ruling over you, justice will be swift. Punishments will be swift. There will be no room for any of the wicked to escape judgment, and they won't be able to endure it. They're going to hate it with a passion. That's why when Satan says, hey, here's your chance. Let's get rid of the rule of Christ and his saints. Let's break free from their shackles and rule over ourselves. That makes sense now? Before I end it? No, second resurrection will be for everyone, even those who during the thousand-year reign, let's say, believed and died. Let me explain something. My understanding of these passages, these are my understanding. Yep, Psalm 2. Uh, in fact, it is Psalm 2. Why do you think I quoted Revelation 2, 26 to 28, Azrin Ajian? Revelation 2, 26, 28 is a direct quotation of Psalm 2, 8 to 9, applied to the church of Jesus Christ, that they will rule over the nations with a rod of iron and dash them like pottery. But it's applied to Jesus and the church ruling over the nations. So yes, it is Psalm 2, Azrin. Psalm 2 is directly quoted in Revelation 2, 26, 28, where Jesus promises the church if they overcome, he will allow them to rule over the nations with a rod of iron and dash them like pottery. Well, that can't be believers ruling over believers because a believer will never dash a, a, a believer to death because believers are made incorruptible and deathless. So it can only apply to believers ruling over unbelievers. Revelation 2, 26 to 28. Don't take my word for it. A direct citation of Psalm 2, 8 to 9, where Jesus extends that promise to his church. Who will come, they will fulfill that promise. Clear? But I put you guys to sleep. Everyone got it? Well, it depends on what period of church history, Zena. Within the first 200 years, as evidenced by... Christians like Papias, who was a disciple of the apostles and the elders, he believed the thousand year of Christ was literal. It's when you get to the last part of the second century, start of the third century, where people started allegorizing the thousand year reign. And then we get to Augustine, who then impacted the Western church to interpret the thousand year spiritually, symbolically. Right? Everyone got it or no? Did I bore you guys with this? Still, we got close to 400. I wanted to see 500, like earlier. Everyone got this? Or did I confuse you guys? Everyone got this? All right. Now, let me add something I think will take place. It's not explicit, but it's implied. Implied? My understanding is when Jesus comes down with believers, all those people that took the mark of the beast, they will die. Not right away, because again, if you read Revelation 19, 11 to 21 carefully, Revelation 19, 11 to 21 carefully, it says Jesus will kill the armies of the beast and the false prophet. He's not killing all the nations. Jesus will kill the armies of the beast, not all unbelievers of the nations. The armies will die, but the unbelievers of the nations will continue to live in their mortal sinful bodies. But those people are the ones who took the mark of the beast, meaning they are fated for hell. Once they took the mark of the beast, they have now blasphemed the spirit, no forgiveness for them. But they will continue to have children. So let's say I'm one of those who took the mark, God forbid, and I survive. And I have Jesus, and I have the believers ruling over the earth. So that means in California, Zena and her brother are ruling Californians. And I'm living in California, and I'm living under her rule and her brother's rule as they answer to Jesus who will be ruling in Jerusalem. Because Zechariah 14, which Jesus fulfills at his second coming, he'll be ruling in Jerusalem physically. Everyone else will spread all over the earth. Okay. I have children. My children are born 
Don't take the mark of the beast. They will have sinful bodies and they will die too during the thousand year. There's a possibility for them to repent and believe during the thousand years because unlike me, they didn't take the mark of the beast. They were born after Jesus descends. So they will have the opportunity to live in sinful bodies with the hope that they'll accept Christ and not rebel against him. 